gastric ulcers. You've probably heard people talk about being so stressed out that they end up with these ulcers. You go to the doctor, doctor can't figure out what's going on. They recommend going to see a psychiatrist. They say it's too much stress. But um, in the recent five to 10 years, people have figured out that there's a strong correlation between the presence of a bacteria called H. pylori and the incidence of ulcers. And so people are trying to find out if that's, there may be a, a cause uh, well, that may be one of the causes for ulcers. But of course, uh, there are exceptions. There are people who have ulcers that have no H. pylori present, and there are people who have H. pylori present who have no ulcers. So um, not really strong, conclusive evidence. So it's another example of strong, there may be a, a strong correlation existing, but maybe not definite causation. Okay, that's a little side interesting thing related to uh, digestive the digestive system and problems that can happen so the digestion of large molecules it happens but very slowly and that's why enzymes are present we've talked about what the purpose of enzymes are and that is to increase or speed up the rate of reactions that would normally happen very slowly and but it helps our body to be very efficient so um, this is the basic diagram showing how enzymes function breaking down a particular product. You should know already exactly how enzymes work by reducing the activation energy required to make a reaction happen, either to break apart separate things or to put different things together. The digestive system is a perfect place to talk about enzymes because of amylases, lipases, and uh, proteases, which will break down carbohydrates, lipids, or proteins and they are necessary basically to speed up the whole process so you need to know a few examples of each type of these main digestive enzymes so salivary amylase it, you can also find pancreatic amylase as well too that could come up so make sure you know that the pancreas is another source of amylase and we just say that's pancreatic amylase instead of salivary amylase so in this case the example is salivary amylase producing the salivary glands will break down a polysaccharide called starch make sure you're able to use all this vocabulary polysaccharide called starch and it gets broken down into a disaccharide called maltose optimum ph for salivary amylase is roughly what the ph is in the mouth which is ph 7. if you're talking about pancreatic amylase why does this thing keep showing up Pancreatic amylase, and you're talking about a pH slightly higher, maybe around pH 8, okay, slightly more basic. Protease means in general, well, this sounds like protein, so ase indicates that it's an enzyme, amylase, protease, lipase, or lipase. Um, pepsin is, is an example of a protease. It is found, it is produced in the wall of the stomach, and it breaks down large polypeptides or proteins into smaller polypeptides um, or amino acids and so you should know that in the stomach it's fairly acidic so pH 1.5 which is within a range that is acceptable for an answer. Uh, lipase produced in the pancreas will break down lipids. Remember lipids are made up of, tr of glycerol and fatty acids and so those will be the products fatty acids and glycerol uh, make sure you know this word triglycerides triglycerides these are the substrate that lipase lipases will basically act on to break them down into their subunits of fatty acids and glycerol and approximate ph why is that so slow neutral to slightly alkaline slightly basic ph seven to eight um, Pause video right here, see if you can answer this for yourself. Okay, moving on. The structure of a villus. Villus is singular. Villi means uh, more than one villus or plural. Uh, that word is not supposed to be there. Here's a diagram of a villus. So basically, if you're looking at, if you're looking inside the stomach, all right, uh, 
and you're traveling from the stomach down into the small intestine. The small intestines are probably the most, well, all of it's important, but where the good stuff actually gets absorbed into the bloodstream, that all happens in the small intestine. And the small intestine is covered with tiny little projections like this, which are called villi. And each one of these is a fold of the uh, inner wall of the small intestine. It increases the surface area. This is another place where surface area to volume ratio uh, comes up. It's very, very important. This greatly increases the efficiency, the rate at which we absorb things into our bloodstream. And we're very active organisms that require uh, a lot of energy. So the more nutrients we can get in in a shorter amount of time, uh, the faster we can function. So just a few things here to take a look at. There's a difference between the words absorption and assimilation. If that thing shows up one more time, absorption and assimilation. Absorption is exactly what it sounds like. It means things get absorbed into the body. So theoretically, when something is in my small intestine, it's still in this tube, but technically we'd say it hasn't really absorbed it into my body. So the stuff that's flowing through the small intestines, when it actually passes through the wall of the small intestines and into my bloodstream, we call that absorption, absorption. So each one of these little things we mentioned is called a villus, uh, increases surface area. Let's take a look right here, as we mentioned before. Now, assimilation. So the, the thing here is absorption versus assimilation. Um, when you say that food or nutrients are assimilated, you're technically saying it's actually being used to build something that is being used inside the body. So absorption just means those nutrients pass into my bloodstream. Assimilation means those nutrients that were absorbed have already been delivered and have been constructed or turned into enzymes or turned into uh, insulation tissue or turned into proteins or other functional things in the body. So they already have become something. So my body has taken those Lego building blocks and turned them into something that's useful. That's called assimilation. So just a few quick things to label when you get a diagram like this. Epithelium means the outer layer. It's one cell thick. So how is this great? Well, things can uh, pass, can diffuse uh, quite easily either through diffusion or active transport one way or the other. A layer of microvilli, so even uh, this one thing is a villus, but these are all individual pro projections coming out of the villus, further increasing the surface area. They contain protein channels and pumps to help move things when they're going against their concentration gradient uh, through active transport. Blood capillaries are running around here as well. So this if we say this is the villus, then up here, if you try to imagine we're inside a small intestine, this will be the space that all the nutrients are flowing and the nutrients can absorb into this area here and enter the, these tiny thin blood capillaries. And when they enter the tiny thin blood capillaries, eventually they reach the rest of your bloodstream and can be delivered to all the other parts of your body. So another good structure to function relationships. Close to the surface, diffusion distance is small. Right in the middle is something called a lacteal, and it will carry away any fats that have passed through here. You don't want too many fats passing through into your bloodstream as that's going to cause uh, blood clots and things like that. So the lacteal will carry it there. Goblet cells will secrete mucus to keep everything moist. So um, generally you should know the inside of your body all in the alimentary canal from the mouth. Uh, it's going all the way through to the anus. It's pretty moist there. And having that moistness will actually increase the rate of diffusion. And you, we find that in the lungs as well when we, when we visit that a little bit later. And finally, some functions of the stomach and the intestines. This is pretty basic. Protein digestion begins in the stomach. It's very acidic in here. And uh, acidity is good for, well, killing bacteria. And in case you eat things off the floor, you don't follow the five second rule. For me personally, it's a 23 second rule. And uh, because of the acidity there, you have to make sure that your enzymes that are functioning inside there um, will function at that particular pH. So if it's very acidic, then your enzymes have to be able to work in very low pHs. 
Digestion continues into the small intestines, and then you have a few other enzymes that are doing that. Amylase, we talked about. Lipase, we talked about. Trypsin is another enzyme that breaks down proteins, if you want to write that down. Breaks down proteins. And so generally in the small intestine, the pH will be uh, slightly more alkaline than neutral. So we're talking about pH 8 to 9 around there. The end products are absorbed by the villi, as we discussed. Indigestible food and water will pass a large intestine. The large intestine is responsible for reabsorbing a lot of the water that's left over. Um, that's what explains, that's kind of, one of the things that determines how uh, the consistency of feces when it exits the, exit, exits the body, if it's very hard or if it's very watery and diseases can play a role in that as well. Okay, water is reabsorbed in the large intestine and uh, leaving semi-solid feces and it's egested. That's a fancy word for saying getting rid of out of the body through the anus. Okay, so ingest means to take in through the mouth. Uh, egest for us means to get rid of waste through the anus. And this is something you can try at home if you want to so take a look at that. Alrighty, uh, post any questions that you have online. Thanks.